You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. The Fed raised rates by 75 basis points again in September, bringing the overnight lending rate to three to three and a quarter percent. The last time we were here was in 2008. I'm Kathy Fetke and welcome to The Real Well Show. To help us understand how these rate hikes might affect real estate, I've invited John Burns of John Burns Real Estate Consulting to give us some insight. John Burns has offices all over the country advising its research subscribers and consulting clients on the shifts in housing demand, supply, and affordability, as well as consumer building products and design trends. John has a bachelor's in economics from Stanford University and an MBA from UCLA. And he's here with us today on The Real Wealth Show. John Burns, welcome back to The Real Wealth Show. Great to see you again, Kathy. It has been quite a year, and I think we just saw rates go up again this week. I thought it would be a full point, not three quarters. So where does that leave us? Do you think mortgage rates will go up too? Uh, Boy, you know, I'm not going to stick my neck out. The bond market is saying they're going to go down. And the bond market's wrong all the time, but um, I, I'm not going to. I'm going to bet with the bond market. I I think they're, they're telling us that the Fed is doing what they're supposed to be doing to bring inflation down. So um, we'll see. Yeah. Okay. Well, the housing market is, has changed dramatically in what is it nine months now? Maybe even less right. than that, six months. Uh, what are you, you? It doesn't sound like you want to do any forecasting, but. Um, <laughs> Are you in the camp of we're going to see prices stabilize or go up because there's lack of inventory, or are we going to see a major crash? <laughs> well, um, if anybody thinks prices are going up or stabilizing, their head is in the sand because they 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 have already been falling. So this isn't mm-hmm. forecasting, Kathy. They're <laughs> falling. Uh, we we. Um, I'll give you some interesting data points on that. Uh, we survey more than a thousand resale agents every month, and in February, I think eighty-nine percent of them said prices were trending up, and in but by June, more of them said prices were falling than rising. So, I'm saying the peak, the hot was February, and with June was when prices started falling. The percentages are different, but the home builders, it was the exact same timing. The peak was February. The June was when more were dropping prices than um, raising prices. But in July, we asked them, how much have you dropped prices this year? And this is a 20% sample size. It's huge. 5%. So home builders had already dropped for prices 5% by July just to get some sales going. But what, you know, they're in a different situation than, for example, flippers. Their their margins were eight to ten percent higher than normal. So you know, if I got to drop price five percent, that's still above normal margins. Um, that, that that's how they were phrasing it to me. Is I just got to get back to January pricing. So that's that's what they've been doing, and that's not working as well now either. So I think there's another leg down. What's a typical margin for a builder? So gross margin before their uh, their. SG&A is about 20%, and that's what they report to Wall Street because everybody's sales expense, general administrative expense is um, different. It's usually about 10% uh, pre-tax net income. That's how they underwrite land. But we've so got this whole thing charted. They were at 20% until COVID, and then they shot up to 28 So a 5% uh, drop in price is, really affects the bottom line. Yeah, it goes straight to the bottom line, but that that would put them at a 23% gross margin, which is still above normal. And, um, you know, their balance sheets have never been stronger. So, and they borrowed money at a fixed interest rate that's not due for years. So they're just saying, John, I've I've got the balance sheet to be able to do this. I'm just going to keep generating cash and keep the machine going. Interesting. So you you're not worried that uh, and are you t- are you talking mostly national builders or uh, smaller talking, builders? I'm, well, we've we've got the data on national builders because forty two percent of them are publicly traded, so they disclose the data. The other fifty eight percent is just through comments through our, through our clients. I, I think my private builder clients, by and large, have their best balance sheets ever too, but they don't have the same debt. Um, I mean, their their balance sheets are not as strong as the public builders. That really surprises me. I thought 
builders were in big trouble today, but it sounds like they've put themselves in a much better position than uh, 14 years ago. Well, they, they did. Um, they learned some lessons. And I'll also say their bankers learned some lessons too. So the, mm. the banking industry on construction lending has been, and I'm talking about regulated banks here, has been extremely conservative and um, that's helping them. I, I know there's people that have gone to other lending services that are taking more risk. And I'm just talking about, you know, the bigger companies that I'm sure there are some companies that are, that cannot handle a five to 10% price decline. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, with all the increases in, in uh, the cost of materials. And would you say that the national builders were affected as adversely as the smaller builders when it comes to the, the cost of goods? Or did they already have kind of their supply chain figured out? Uh, they were they were very impacted, but not nearly as impacted as everybody else. Mm -hmm. you, you know, they were able to go to the largest trades and say, I'm going to keep you busy all year long and get better pricing that way. And if you're a sales guy selling drywall or whatever, who, who's going to get, who's going to get the windows, mm -hmm. the guy that orders a thousand windows a year or the guy that orders 50. So mm -hmm. it, it, it wasn't just a pricing thing, Kathy. I think it was an availability uh, thing. And so they, even though their cycle times have probably extended maybe two months, smaller builders have extended more than that. So if someone were wanting to buy a new home today, they might get a better deal with a national builder. Well, if the private builders aren't doing what the, the public builders are, that's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, I mean I, they, you know, the other advantage they have is they have their own mortgage division. And so a lot of the, a lot of the price declines I'm talking about aren't flat out price declines. They're more like, hey, I'm going to take $10,000 and set it aside and buy down your interest rate for you in the first two years and, and those sorts of things. So th that seems to be working. People just hated the number five in front of a mortgage rate. And now you know, six is going to be really tough. So that's how a lot of the builders are getting through this. They're buying down the rate for the client. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Uh, which markets are have perhaps overbuilt? Any, any? Uh, well, I, I think clearly Boise is the poster child for what, what can go wrong. Um, so Boise, I, Austin, Houston, and Dallas are building more homes than ever before. Now they've been economic engines too, so they could withstand that. I, I think Austin is set to ro roll over here pretty hard because they've been relying on affluent people coming in from California with tech jobs and the tech sector isn't working very well. And Houston has uh, 900 actively selling new home communities right now. So just that alone is making it extremely competitive and prices are falling there too. Interesting. Uh, which areas would you say are still dramatically undersupplied where maybe the builders didn't focus? Well, te Texas is the only markets in Nashville, too, I think, that are building more than ever before. Uh, I mean, I'll answer your question a different way. The demand is still flooding into Florida. So even though construction has ramped up quite a bit in Florida, that's where we're seeing the least amounts of distress, if you will, is in Florida. Interesting. Um, and is that from people from the Northeast or just from all over the country? Uh, it's definitely from the Northeast. Our team in Florida has been telling me for the last few years, it's amazing how many Californians are in Florida. Mm -hmm. You're used to hearing Californians going to Nevada and Arizona. This, the last eight to 10 years, it's been Texas and, and Florida. Yeah, I've seen that too. I, uh, one of our own employees, um, you know, picked up, sold their house in Walnut Creek for a lot of money and bought a house in Florida and the best part of Florida and the best school districts and uh, paid less than half for a twice the price, uh, uh, twice the size of the house near the ocean, you know? Yep. Yep. So well, they had, they had to put up with the August weather in Florida though. <laughs> <We didn't. laughs> that is maybe a good time to do some traveling. <laughs> Oh, very good. Okay. So we know that home prices are on the decline, but we also know that there is still demand, but maybe not everywhere. So what, how severe do you see this uh, downturn and how long might it last? 
I mean, we're we're all guessing there. I mean, we're we're hoping that we can just rip the band-aid off and get this over with. Uh, but you know, the, the these Fed interest rate cycles that create recessions eventually usually take about twelve months for the recession to play out. So we're what we're maybe about six or seven months in. So we're we're not there yet. I, I've been hearing some really bearish comments from the CEOs of J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, who see what's going on in Europe. Um, and it sounds to me like they're forecasting a recession driven by Europe. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you saw what the FedEx announced, huge disappointments. Like People are not shipping goods all over the world anymore either. It's, it sounds like the economic concern is in Europe. And our dollar has got so strong that everything they might want to purchase from us has gotten crazy expensive, too. So businesses in America that sell overseas um, are starting to report some lackluster sales because the dollar is so strong. And, and this is being engineered by the Fed. Yeah, as it normally is. So in the past recessions that you've seen, how long does it take for people to get out of the uh, you know, the euphoria stage into the reality? Um, it usually takes a very long time. Uh, I think it's going to be much shorter this cycle because the information flow is so quick. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I've been through a few downturns, and I usually find the new home market leads the resale market dramatically because that's somebody who has an empty home that has to sell it, right? Versus a resale home, oh, I can leave it on the market for another 30 or 60 days. Uh, It seems to me the resale market reacted just as quickly this cycle, which really surprised me. So I, uh, you know, most of the people I'm talking to get it and see it. And and frankly, depending on what you're doing for a living, um, are telling me that we weren't really surprised. I mean, we saw 40% price appreciation in 30 months. Then mortgage rates rose from three to six. I mean, <laughs> what do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what about areas that didn't see 40% gains? Um, you know, are, are there parts of the country that are safe havens for investors, particularly people who are uh, looking to buy property to rent out? Uh, and that's a totally different topic, right? Because yeah. If people can't afford to buy a home, those people may have to rent. Um, so the rental market could be stronger than than the what? sales market. So I, which which areas do you see as kind of off the radar? <laughs> or um, well, re, re, yeah, it's a diff, completely different story in the rental market. I mean, the, the rising mortgage rates keeps people who wanted to buy a home in the rental market. <laughs> So the re- rental market has been really strong. The economy is still Dallas is still strong. The uh, markets that are tourism-based, like Orlando, Las Vegas, huge job growth there. That creates a lot of jobs, creates rental demand. Um, you know, the, the challenge there for investors is just the borrowing costs have gone up pretty dramatically, too. So I need, I need a better yield than I um, – or a, more rent, I should say, and a higher yield pre-debt uh, service – than a year ago, and prices would need to adjust for that to be the case. So I'm not saying it's easy there from an investor standpoint, but I, I agree with you that rental demand is strong. And I th- I see a lot of home builders pivoting their for sale communities to be for rent um, for exactly that reason. I mean, they've got the people coming in that want to be in the house, and they just can't afford it anymore. And they're like, well, we'll come up with a structure. We can rent it to you, and then hopefully rates will come down, and then you can buy it later. Do you think builders would ever catch on to the idea of a, you know, kind of a, what am I trying to say, um, lease to own type of situation? Yeah, that has been talked about so much. It, um, you know, and, and uh, Blackstone is doing that with Home Partners of America, and there's a few, and Divi Homes has that. So there are some of those uh, formats out there. It just, it restricts the profit at the end of the day because usually you're locking in the strike price for the renter today. And if prices go up way more, then they get all the profit. So it, it seems mm-hmm. to me that um, they'd rather just lease it. And then mm-hmm. when the timing is right, make the decision whether or not to sell it to them. Fascinating. So are you starting to see builders pivot? 
Oh, check this out. So <laughs> D.R. Horton, Horton announced on their earnings call, so this is public information, they've repurposed 115 for sale communities to be for rent. Wow. Yeah. And they've got about a thousand communities right now. So think of them as like taking 10% of their communities and making them rentals. And they just hire an in-house property management company or they? No, they, they, they lease it up and they sell it as soon as it gets uh, almost completely leased. They've already, they've already, they've already, they've been doing this for a while on a much smaller scale at huge margins. Uh, they reported 40% gross margin, you know, double the normal <laughs> gross margin on some of those. And what they're doing is they're finding kind of the higher density parcels, maybe the less desirable areas for a homeowner are perfectly fine for a landlord um, to rent them out. And so that those are the parcels that the industry tends to be repurposing. So they're not necessarily holding them for themselves. They're getting a tenant uh, in and then selling to an institutional fund. That's right. Lennar created a $4 billion joint venture with Centerbridge and another organization. And that joint venture is going to hold some of those homes. Uh, there, wow. There's a there's a group in Houston, Camillo Properties, who did this during the last cycle. They pivoted everything from for sale to for rent, and they got four thousand rental homes starting in 2010. It's a different it's a different capital structure. I mean, you need different partners and different lenders. Mm -hmm. But that, that, that's that's what it takes. I feel like I'm getting insider information here from um, the great John Burns. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, they're disclosing all this on their public <laughs> calls. I guess I just listen to them. <laughs> yeah, that's you do, and that's that is fascinating. Um, I, I, I wonder why they wouldn't. Yeah, well, it sounds like they are partially holding them if they've set up a JV arrangement. Yeah, because I mean, and what their shareholders say: if I want rental income, I'll go buy invitation homes or American homes for read. I buy, you know, your stock for as a home builder. Mm -hmm. So their shareholders don't want them holding on to that. Right. It's, a, it's a different owner that does. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, my goodness. That is fascinating. Uh, I wonder how that will affect the mom and pop landlords. I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, it'll, it'll create some more rentals in some brand new homes and some new rental supply in the market. But you and I have talked about this before. I'm a huge bull on the need for more quality rental homes managed by a professional landlord who can do good service and the whole thing. Um, I think there's a lot of pent up demand there. Okay, good. So um, speaking on the rental market, do, do you see any issues there with new supply coming on with multifamily and these build to, to rent communities, um, you know, over stocking rental supply? <laughs> In certain markets, um, well, we have a forty-year high of apartments under construction right now. So there, there is going to be a lot of apartments hitting the market next year, and some of the build to rent is uh, they call them horizontal apartments. I mean, they don't have an attached garage. Um, I think that's got, that could get overbuilt because they compete directly with the apartments. They were, the only difference is they have a small little yard, and so somebody who has a dog would rather be in that than in an apartment. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, detached homes, I'm trying to remember the percentages here. I think they're, the bill to rent is maybe 3% of single-family construction right now, and it's 10% of all the rental construction when you include apartments. And I think 25 or 26% of people – renters live in a house. So what I'm saying is that construction is still a small percentage of the demand, if you will. And we've learned the last few years that there's been so few opportunities for consumers to rent a new house that the premium on a new house to rent is, is more than any of us thought. Hmm. Interesting. Which could maybe cover the the increased cost of capital. Well, it has been. Yeah. So yeah. All, all of our clients have been having massive cost of overruns, had to push rents because of it, and they've been getting that and then more. So on the multifamily side, are you seeing, um, with all this all this new product coming online, are you seeing that affect cap rates? Uh, so I've, we've been doing a fair amount of research on that. Cap rates have come up, but not as much as you would think they have. Mm -hmm. What what I'm understanding is, I mean, the cost of debt has come up about 150, 200 basis points, pretty substantially. But the lenders are not raising their interest rates as much. They're just asking for more equity. 
So, you know, they'll, they'll keep the interest rate pretty darn low, but you may need to put in 35, 40% equity instead of 20, 25. That's how they're protecting themselves and keeping the rates low. Interesting. Are you still doing your reports that you used to do years ago, kind of showing the number of new permits versus new jobs in the area? I know that was one of the first things I subscribed to when I heard about you. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, that we, we now produce 70 pages on more than 100 metro areas every month, and we have a dashboard where you can sort them. And the job to permit ratios are really strong right now because the economy's jobs, you have to look at it year over year because the job market is cyclical. So you got to compare a July to a July and an August to an August. The job growth right now is 5%, which is uh, in, insanely high, but it's misleading because it's the hospitality workers that are recovering and getting their jobs back that are driving that. Uh, I I think the job growth is going to slow down dramatically within the next 12 months, even without the Fed, because the the big demographic shift that's been happening and is really hitting the next year is for the first year ever, we're going to have the same number of people graduating from school as we do turning 65. So, so where is the growth of labor going to come from <laughs> when mm. we have such a surge in retirement? Mm. Wow. I mean, Do you we're, have we're any- heading right into the peak birth years in the late 1950s, and they're all hitting the retirement years. Oh, that's fascinating. Do you see us heading the way of Japan where there won't be enough workers for the aging population? Uh, I mean, there's some similarities. We're we're still growing, but the growth is a lot smaller than it used to be. And Japan has no immigration per se. We, we have immigration, so immigration can, can create some of the growth, but uh, retirement is going to be a big drag. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, and there was a concern that with all these aging baby boomers that there would suddenly be a glut of homes on the market, but um, that's not really happening yet. Well, they got to live somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Right. I mean, at, at what point would uh, would that be true where, you know, they would start to move on to senior housing or to yeah. heaven? Well, the, so the, the peak birth year was, well, the, the baby boom really got started in 46, 47. They're all turning 75. So, you know, I don't know what you consider the year. I haven't done all the mortality thing. But once <laughs> you get to 80, that's when we start. We, we're maybe five years away from the beginning of uh yeah, you want to be in the funeral business because that, that's going to be a booming business <laughs> unless they come up with a magic pill where you and I will live for a very long time. <laughs> and a lot of inheritance. It seems like a lot of wealth transfer at that time. Huge. Yep. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. That'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I agree. All right. Well, John, any any last tidbits of gems you want to give, give us? <laughs> um. Well, the tidbit would be start paying attention to what the CEOs are saying. Those are instead of some of the data. The data is very backward looking. Some of it's misleading. But, you know, shipping companies, UPS, uh, FedEx, the big banks, uh, the, the tone of what they're saying will tell you whether or not we should be more bullish or bearish. And that, that's what I'm picking up this cycle. All right, John. Well, as always, it's a pleasure to have you here on The Real Wealth Show. It's been really enlightening. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Kathy. Good luck. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. You can go to realwealthshow.com to get more insights on what's happening in specific markets in the U.S. Again, that's realwealthshow.com. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.